things first. I officially deem you two members of the Rebel Corps. So, with that said... Welcome to the Resistance, comrades! Hello everyone, so good to see you. It's time, my friends, for a new Persona 5 title. The newest spinoff in the series, Persona 5 Tactica, aims to blend strategy RPG elements with the Persona formula. I was fortunate enough to play a demo of this game at this year's PAX West and got an okay enough handle of the game. Honestly, a 15 minute demo doesn't really give you enough time to soak in a game with as many moving parts as this, but I grasped onto enough that I knew I wanted to try the full game. It's a turn-based RPG in which you take control of three characters on a gridded field. It follows the core formula of games like Into the Breach or Mario plus Rabbit Sparks of Hope. And in my opinion, the blending of all-out attacks, one mores, personas, and other series staples makes for one of the most interesting entries in this genre that I've ever played. So let's not waste any time and dive right in. Let's start the mission, Joker! Let's go! Okay! Roger that. Here I Let's do this! It's Leave it to me. <laughs> Persona 5 Tactica takes place after the events of the original game, though this largely acts as its own self-contained story. It doesn't necessarily need you to know any other title to understand the plot. One day, while chilling out in LeBlanc Cafe, the party feels a strange quake and a door appears at the entrance. Upon going through it, the Phantom Thieves find themselves in a bizarre European-style world with monsters that they've never had encountered before. You're given a brief introduction to battle, laying out the very basic mechanics before you. You control a maximum of three units at a time on a grid-based map. Each unit can move a certain distance before they can act. If at a distance, you can use your gun to fire at an enemy, ideally from behind cover. Terrain is going to make all the difference, and you'll want to end your turn behind at least some cover as it'll guard you from enemy attacks. Those same enemies might also be hiding behind cover, so another option would be to walk right up to them and attack them directly. Depending on your position, you can slam enemies into others and force them out of cover, leaving them defenseless. Attacking a defenseless enemy or landing a critical hit will grant you another move or one more, allowing you to continue your turn. This is all just the tip of the iceberg as the tutorial comes to a brisk end. It isn't long before we meet this very mean and very pink lady, Marie, who brainwashes nearly all of the Phantom Thieves except for Joker and Morgana. The new and dynamic art style during these sequences hits you like a tank, or perhaps more fittingly, like an all-out attack? It's just like I've always dreamed! Before getting completely decimated, you're saved by a person that we've never seen before. This is Arena, and she is cool. After getting rescued, you head over to her base of operations, which is... LeBlanc? Definitely something strange going on here. Arena is the marquee character introduced with this title, the headstrong leader of a group called the Rebel Corps that opposes Marie and her twisted legionnaires. With the rest of the Phantom Thieves brainwashed, Joker, Morgana, and Arena team up to take the battle to her. We quickly learn that the Rebel Corps are not very substantial in number. Are these guys from the Cap Kingdom? Well, this is definitely not a kingdom that's been friendly to them. That's actually what these spaces in this world are called. Marie's kingdom is only the first that you'll explore as you recruit the Phantom Thieves back to your side. Not long into the story, you'll also meet Toshiro. He's, um, just a man. Poor Toshiro is just a regular politician who has no idea what all this absurdity is and I feel for him. I actually really like to see his character develop as the regular guy stuck here with all the weirdos. You'll be unraveling the mystery as to why you're all here and what role the crew plays in this corner of the metaverse. If that's even what this place is. Arena stands out as a solid addition to the team, despite not having a persona, providing strong support and a powerful voice. She also definitely has her moments of being a dork. I call it Operation Sneaky Sneaky Bang Bang. I hope this plan's better than the name. I'm sure you've also noticed, but Persona 5 Tactica adapts a new art style that we haven't seen in the series before, something between the original art style and the chibi characters of the Persona Q games. It's very clean in both still art during conversations and in cutscenes, allowing for a level of expressiveness not seen before. It overall fits the atmosphere of the game, which itself can be even more over the top than what you might be used to. Like when the Rebel Corps gets <gasps> used as cake decorations? Aw oh, no, they went from top hats to cake toppers. I'm trying, okay? There's a lot of fun use of the classic squash and stretch animation, which feels right at home given the chaotic tone of the game. It can also link to being a little more goofy, all things considered. I didn't expect this game to be as charming as it is, and will keep your attention with its story and characters between battles. Once the premise of the story is more or less established after getting your party members back, the game will lean more into the tactical gameplay than exposition. 
As mentioned earlier, the introduction to combat is really just the start. Along with your gun and melee attacks, you can, of course, use your personas in battle. Each element also carries an additional effect, like moving enemies away from you, towards you, freezing them, or making them unable to act in their next turn, to name some effects. And despite having the same basic skills, they all function uniquely. Each type of gun has different ranges and attack styles. Some might be stronger single shots, or others will attack with an area of effect. Different characters have different movement ranges as well. Yusuke can move 7 spaces per turn, but doesn't strike as hard as other units. Haru, on the other hand, is a powerhouse with an explosive gun effect, but has the shortest movement of 4 spaces. You can also choose to end a turn without having a unit act, which will give a party member a charge, and the enhancement is different for each unit. This makes it so no action goes wasted in this game. There is always something to consider for the next turn. These all contribute to give each unit a role to fulfill, and does a good job to not make any one character vastly preferable to another. Everyone, given their same base functions, can work together to knock down enemies and give a unit one more move. While in this one more state, if you can triangulate your positions just right, you can pull off a triple threat, essentially the all-out attacks of this game. This can decimate your enemy forces, and the game is very clear with telling you when one is possible. So don't be afraid to take your time and run around the map a bit trying to figure out the best course of action. You'll have to be very mindful and particular with your positioning in this game. From going into cover for protection, to potentially chaining multiple triple threats in a row if you have different characters using one more on their turn. Surveying the battlefield and landing these strikes can be your most powerful asset that can really turn a battle around and this very well will assist in reaching the extra goals that each battle has marked for you. Meeting these optional objectives will get you extra experience and money. The EXP, by the way, doesn't go to individual characters, but to one collective Phantom Thieves level. Everyone also has their own individual skill tree for you to customize your units even more intricately. <gasps> skill trees. This is where all of your unique abilities can be upgraded, and more sections will be unlocked as the story progresses. You can very freely remove and reallocate skills whenever you need to. I never understood games that require you to reset the whole tree to redistribute skills. This just makes a lot more sense. Battles themselves are a lot shorter than I expected them to be. The story itself consists of multiple smaller battles between shorter scenes. That back and forth keeps the pace going and doesn't let any single battle or scene drag on too long. In between those battles and scenes, you'll be prepping yourself at your base of operations, Le Bon Café. Here, you can take all the time that you need to prep your party with abilities, view key information, shop for new weapons, chat with your allies, and visit the Velvet Room. Since this is not one of the mainline titles, Igor will not be present, and as before, Levenza will attend to you, fulfilling the role to provide all the assistance you need. It's always nice to see more of her given how little screen time she had previously. Even an attendant isn't 100% sure what the Phantom Thieves have landed in this time, but she's fully committed to helping Joker find the answer at the end of his journey. The Velvet Room now takes the shape of a foundry, and the help provided has changed to reflect this thematically. Even in his blacksmith outfit, I ask, why is she so precious? You cannot freely switch your personas during battle. The one you equip before starting a map is the one you're with, unless you give Lavenza a call using an app. And this time, the other fan of these can take advantage of using different ones now too. It's a lot like the Persona Q series, in which every member has their signature one, but also a swappable sub-persona now, multiplying your options in battle. Fusion is much more simplified in this game. Personas take the form of gears that you earn after battle, and each have a main ability. When fusing, you can inherit one extra ability to complement the main one, whether it's an attack, support, or passive skill. It's kinda nice to not jump through as many hoops to get the exact persona that I want, as you'll be swapping many of them around with your entire party very frequently. And as before, there's always the slight chance that your fusion process will fail, and it's, uh... Look, she's trying her best. Just because you're an avatar of a higher order doesn't mean you can't have an off day. Not long into the story, Irina takes hold of the Flag of Freedom, a metaphorical and literal icon that is the key to setting your friends free. It continues the theme of rebellion, with the flag itself symbolizing liberation and freedom. It becomes the first unique skill you can use and introduces you to the Voltage Gauge, which rises when you attack or receive damage. I guess the revolution will be televised after all. I mean, I'm on Team Arena, are you? The flag, by the way, is in Latin and loosely translates to, if you want peace, 
conquer yourself. Ah, yes, persona and foreign languages. Latin, but also a lot of French. Mechanics continue to be introduced, sometimes in pairs. On the same map that introduces elevation and taking the high ground for an advantage, you'll also be tasked to escort characters like Toshiro who cannot fight to a designated area. Someone buy this poor guy a drink. You can even pull off a triple threat in varying elevations. Later, you can even smack an enemy off of the elevated areas and have a friend follow up with another attack. They introduce Baton Pass, but more is a term for when a unit gets knocked out. You can tag a unit and reserve in, but you'll be limited to just how many times you can do this depending on the difficulty level. Any unit that has not participated in the previous battle will be in peak condition, increasing their maximum HP and SP. There's also bonus effects that can pile on and increase HP, SP, melee, and range attacks, which varies depending on who's in your party. And despite what you might be familiar with in other Persona games, Joker is in fact not required to be in the party for every battle. You can mix and match your team however you like, whether it's part of the main story or one of the very many side quests. Yup, we've got those too! These optional quests will allow you to obtain more GP to spend on skill trees and even gain new Personas. Some quests are quite a bit shorter than the main story ones. This one in particular is meant to get Arena from one side of the map to the other in a single turn. There are multiple quests that are treated more like a puzzle, as this one teaches the concept of one more to chain multiple turns on a single unit. They serve as active tutorials, which highlight just how useful and integral some of your options can be in combat. As a player, I find them to be a very practical use of my time. There's just so many little spinning gears that turn this game into what it is, and a lot of it, for being adapted from the classic Persona formula, just works. It also works seamlessly into the UI. Did I mention the user interface yet? Look at that UI! How do they keep getting away with this series looking so dynamic and good every time? The use of analogous colors, sometimes combined with neutral palettes. Oh, and the transitions! Look at these all-out attacks and their cut-ins! It never ceases to catch my eye. But if big, bold streaks of single colors isn't your thing, might I direct you to the extra DLC campaign? This is an entirely separate episode titled Repaint Your Heart that puts a spin on the usual rules we've grown accustomed to. While the main game seems to occur after the events of Persona 5, this one takes place sometime in November of Persona 5 Royal. Or at least I believe so, as Kasumi and Akechi are the main party members joining you this time. Repaint Your Heart released as Day 1 DLC for $20 and follows this trio as they tell a series of graffiti that has started appearing all over the city. One of them in particular depicts Arsene. Huh. It shouldn't be possible to know what Joker's persona looks like unless you've been to the metaverse. Their search leads the trio directly into a fight in a completely new world. The rules of battle now hinge on the application of paint on the battlefield. If you stand in the enemy's purple paint color, you won't be able to act or cover. That also applies to the enemy if they're on your team's teal paint. Every attack will scatter paint and make friend or foe standing in the opposite color vulnerable. This flips the usual strategies from the main game on its head, and you'll have to rethink how to approach combat. Your usual instinct to go into cover is no longer as safe as before, as it brings a refreshing twist to the usual formula without making the players feel too far out of familiar territory. It's interesting that unlike the main game and Persona 5 in general, which made its identity with its vivid reds, blacks, and whites, Repaint Your Heart goes all in with a much wider spectrum. Seeing this many colors on a screen at once in a Persona game kind of threw me off, but as a story which follows the theme of street art, it works flawlessly. Every battle is a constant back and forth, with each hit splattering more paint in a series of turn-based turf wars. And no, I'm not going to say it! The main antagonist is the sadistic Guernica, and you team up with Luca to take out her army as you take the fight to the streets. Instead of fusing personas, you'll be given set ones after each battle to apply to your party of three. You'll be fast-tracking character growth and will want to update your skills and personas before every battle, as this is only a 4-5 to five hour campaign. Upon completion, you can unlock new key art, extra difficult challenges, and the option to use Kasumi and Akechi in the main game. Or, well, that's half correct. You need to complete Repaint Your Hearts and the main game first. Then, only on a new game plus can you have them alongside you in battle. And like, I did expect that they wouldn't impact the story or anything, simply serving to be more units to use during a fight, but you cannot use them on your first playthrough. I enjoy this game in the DLC, don't get me wrong, but I don't see myself going immediately back into the game when I finish just to play as two extra characters. I'm glad they're here at all, especially after their absence in Persona 5 Strikers, but it's a little sad to see Kasumi getting halfway shafted yet again. Overall, Tatsuka feels great and a solid choice to pick up if you're a fan of Persona 5 and or turn-based strategy games. It's also a great excuse to spend more time with the Phantom Thieves. 
From the flashy high impact combat down to the fun little conversations like Joker thinking about who he would marry. Which in fact can be anyone in your party. Or the realistic option. I know where I'm at in my life right now. But it's games like Persona Q2, Persona 5 Strikers, and now Tactica that remind me why I'm so attached to the Phantom Thieves. And if you're playing the game in English, you'll be happy to know that everyone on the voice cast returns to reprise their roles. They feel like old friends at this point. And whether or not you feel as though they may have overstayed their welcome by now, these are the characters that brought Alice's side series to the mainstream. And don't worry, as excited as I am to revisit Persona 5's world, we're thankfully very close to Persona 3 Reload. Can't wait for some of you to meet these characters for the first time. We're just a few full moons away. And that's my look at Persona 5 Tactica and its DLC. There's a lot of games coming out this season, so I'm glad I had some time for it as a tactical RPG fan. Did you pick up the game? Let us know down below, and if you like what you saw, please leave a like, consider subscribing, boop that bell, and take a peek at our Patreon, where for just $1, you can have access to our private Discord where you can tell me your favorite Bell Room attendant. It's, um, it's probably still Elizabeth. Shout out to Nameless though, man doesn't get enough respect for playing the piano in the Bell Room for this many years, and technically a part of the Headband Clan. He just, uh, he just wears it a little bit low, you know? It's, it's fine. It's all in his artistic vision, which I hope isn't an insult to say to him in hindsight. Alright, that's enough. Thanks for watching, everyone. Till we meet again.